Let's talk about COVID-19, also known as coronavirus. I've seen a lot of confusion on social media in the past few days and would like to help clear up the air, especially for my friends and family back home in Thailand. Since I started making this video, the number of confirmed cases in Thailand has doubled. The virus is spreading at an alarming rate. Look at the US for example. In the past three days, the number of infections has doubled from 1,000 to over 2,000. Thailand is just at the beginning of the steep and difficult incline. We need to start acting now while we're still ahead. But before we do, let's get the basic facts down. On the 11th of March, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 to be a global pandemic. I'm sure a lot of us are wondering what that actually entails, as a pandemic is kind of difficult for the average person to conceptualize. I mean, I don't understand everything either, but I've come across some great data sources that I've compiled to share with you. Coronavirus is a virus that spreads from person to person through respiratory droplets when an infected person coughs or sneezes. It's also possible for the virus to remain on a surface or object, be transferred by touch and enter the body through the mouth, nose, or eyes. Symptoms start as a dry cough and in most cases will include fever and headache. Most people experience mild to moderate symptoms. If you're young and have a functioning immune system, you don't have to panic because your body will be able to work hard to fight off the virus. Although you might get a fever and a headache, the symptoms will pass after a bit of rest and general medicine. However, elderly and immunocompromised people aren't so well equipped. If the virus travels down the windpipe, it can cause pneumonia-like symptoms including inflammation of the alveoli, which restricts the amount of oxygen able to enter the lungs. To prevent other organs giving out, the patient might require a mechanical ventilator to help them breathe. Ventilators, as is, are already a scarce resource in hospitals, especially in rural areas. Who should we be worried about? The answer is elderly people, immunocompromised people, and people with pre-existing medical conditions such as cancer or diabetes because their immune system may not be strong enough to defeat the virus. It's true that young people like us probably won't die if we catch the virus, but because we move around so much, we have the biggest chance of passing it on to others, including our parents and grandparents. Let me show you why. Let's say you touched a contaminated surface on the bus and then wiped your eye. Congratulations, the virus has entered your body and you are now at day zero of infection. In your body, the virus takes a couple of days to grow and is ready to spread by day three. At this point, your body becomes a walking weapon that is ready to hurt anyone you come in contact with. But alerting symptoms often appear later, at average on day five, which means you've already had two days of unregulated human interactions. Maybe you went shopping in Siam, or watched a concert, or ate dinner with your grandparents. Either way, if you still keep going out, you put those around you at risk. Don't be that person. Stay home. You'll keep your family safe, and also save the lives of people you'll never meet. How effective is staying home compared to other preventative measures? Let's examine how diseases spread in a population. In this model, a dot represents a person. A blue dot is a healthy person, while an orange dot is an infected person. If an infected person comes in contact with a healthy person, you can see the disease spread. In reality, people don't stay sick forever, and after a while, their immune system kicks up and defeats the virus, resulting in a recovery shown in purple. Let's see what happens in the community of 200 people who move freely without any restrictions. Look at how fast the disease spreads. That's pretty scary. By the time 14 days passes and people start recovering, the entire population has already experienced the disease. Think of all the people who would be crowding up the hospitals. The doctors and nurses would be thrown into a literal battlefield. Now let's see what happens when the infected area is quarantined people are free to move inside a restricted zone. Although this initially looks effective, it's impossible to completely stop the movement of people with a barrier. What if you live on one side of the zone and work on the other? Eventually, if one person carrying the disease breaks free, it will be no different to the previous free-for-all model. The solution is social distancing, which involves maintaining one to two meters of distance between you and other people and minimizing contact with people in general. Let's see how the infection spreads when 75% of people stay home. 
Although infections still occur, the rate is greatly reduced and not many people are sick at the same time. Hospitals won't have to face a massive influx of very sick people. Some people won't even have to get sick at all. Now let's take it up a notch and see what happens when 87.5% of people stay home. Even with just 12% more people home, the difference is astounding. Suddenly, the epidemic becomes more manageable. Here's a summary of the four situations. These models represent the best case scenario where everyone who gets sick eventually recovers. In reality, that's not the case. People will die, which is why we really need to step up the game to ensure that as few people get sick as possible. COVID is spread from human to human. Thus, if we completely eliminate human interactions, the chance of catching COVID is pretty much zero. We can't wait for a higher power to tell us to do things because by then, it might be too late. Obviously, there are some exceptions to this stay-at-home rule. For instance, doctors, nurses, and public health workers will be needed more than ever. So what are some things you can do to alleviate the situation? Number one, isolate high-risk groups. If your grandma needs to run an errand, consider doing it for her instead to decrease the chances of potential exposure. Number two, avoid public transport. Number three, limit non-essential travel. You can go buy groceries, but you might not want to go to Hua Hin for some gram. Number four, work from home. This isn't possible for everyone, but recently more employers are becoming understanding to the situation. Number five, skip social gatherings. This includes study groups, birthday parties, or even extracurricular activities. Remember, it's not about you, it's about us. We need to work together as a society and make sacrifices in our daily life so we can beat the epidemic while we're still ahead. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it useful.